Why don't we get things kicked off? Um, my name is uh, Dave Woldridge. I'm the Internal Medicine Residency Program Director at UMKC, and I have the honor of introducing today's uh, Goodson Lecturer. So first, a little background about the Goodson Lectureship. The Goodson Lectureship was established in memory of Dr. William Goodson, Jr., who was a longtime internist in Kansas City. He was born in 1909, the son of William Goodson, Sr., a family physician who practiced in Liberty, Missouri. William Jr. was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Missouri and a 1934 graduate of Harvard Medical School. After service as an intern at the Hartford Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, he returned to Liberty to practice with his father for a year before traveling to the Mayo Clinic for a three-year fellowship in internal medicine. He then returned to Kansas City where he practiced general internal medicine and rheumatology from 1940 until his death in 1985. He practiced at Trinity Lutheran Hospital during his entire career, and among his other affiliations, he was a year one docent at UMKC from 1980 to 1982. For Dr. Goodson, medicine was his true avocation as well as his vocation. Like his father, who practiced until age 82, Dr. Goodson saw no reason to quit, and he saw 10 patients in his office the day before he died. By all accounts, Dr. Goodson was the embodiment of the dedicated master clinician. And at the time of his death, his family, patients, colleagues, and friends established this educational program to perpetuate his spirit of inquiry, discovery, and his commitment to patient care. Since 1986, then, the Goodson Lectureship has brought some of the country's finest internists to Kansas City, and we are excited to have Dr. Roger Bush join us as this year's Goodson Lecturer. Dr. Bush is originally from the bustling metropolis of Scobie, Montana, population 1,155 at last check. I learned last night that Scobie is 200 miles from the nearest Starbucks, making it the most remote municipality in the United States. He graduated from UCSF School of Medicine and then completed his IM residency at the Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle. He's done just about everything in internal medicine. He was a primary care physician. He practiced HIV medicine in the early days of that pandemic. He worked as a hospitalist, and now he's a primary care doc for some of the most underserved patients in urban Seattle at the Pike Market Medical Clinic, a federally qualified health center. His many, uh, his, his many medical education roles include, uh, he served on the ACGME's Internal Medicine Review Committee. He helped to develop the internal medicine uh, reporting milestones, the original batch that came out several years ago. For 10 years, he served as the residency program director for the Virginia Mason uh, Internal Medicine Residency Program, and he was also the founding program director of the Internal Medicine Residency at the Billings Clinic in Montana. In terms of service, he's had a variety of national leadership roles in the American College of Physicians, the American Board of Medical Specialties, and the Society for Hospital Medicine. He just recently rotated off the Board of Commissioners for the Joint Commission, and he currently serves as, uh, on the Board of Directors for both the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of Family Medicine. He's a leading expert on rural medicine and serves as technical advisor for rural residency program development which is a HRSA-funded effort to launch rural GME programs. In short, he's done just about everything one can do during a career in internal medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roger Bush to UMKC. Thanks, Dave. Um, and thank you all. Thanks to uh, the Goodson family for uh, supporting this lectureship. I'm really honored to be uh, to be part of it and to have previous Goodson lecturers in the audience with Dennis Palmer. Um, what, a, what a great culture of service and education here. I rarely get into a, an auditorium where we see learners from across the continuum, from early medical students to uh, program directors and deans and family and people that are that rely on us for care patients um, it's uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity um, in speaking to that continuum of care service and learning um, 
my comments today are primarily directed towards rural graduate medical education training. Uh, Dr. Jackson and I were speaking earlier today about, you know, if you, if you just across the board, <clears throat> most medical students, well, 40% of medical students will practice within 50 to 100 miles of where they went to medical school. But 70% of uh, residents will practice within 50 to 100 miles. So as, a, as an investment of societal resources in training, training physicians and healthcare teams where they're going to work is the smart money. So I'm going to talk about um, the critical conversations that are uh, absolutely necessary, uh, both at the beginning of a, generating a new residency program and ongoing to sustain it. Um, I was delighted to learn of the new UMKC campus uh, at St. Joe's. Uh, looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing St. Joe's this afternoon and speaking with the leadership up there as well. Let's see here. Good. So disclosure. Um, this is a CME disclosure. I, I'm a director of ABIM and ABFM. I'm not going to give away any of their secrets or give away any questions. Uh, so <clears throat> the overview today is uh, we're going to talk about graduate medical education prog uh, programs, the models and the training options in different specialties. You know, just airdropping a family doc into a small town without the team to support them is, is not a solution. It, it might be a beginning, but it's probably the beginning of burnout and, and isolated desperation rather than a, a, a solution. This is a community effort. The critical conversations need to involve the entire community. Uh, after all, uh, healthcare is what makes, what, what holds a lot of these small towns together. So it, we need to engage everyone in a robust, honest uh, conversation. It takes money. It's not about money. Uh, it's about the work, but it, money is how we measure resources, and it does take resources for, uh, for a graduate medical education program. And then I can share some of the tripwires we've seen, both I've seen personally by starting two programs and running one, and as a technical advisor to developing rural programs, we can see recurrent themes of things go wrong. When, when, the wagon, when the wheels fall off the wagon, it's a limited number of causes that usually do it. <clears throat> so what do rural areas need? They need, first and foremost, primary care. And the family medicine model of comprehensive care is the best way to start. You know, I was, I, I was recall, I think actually a general surgeon in Dr. Bill Goodson's department taught me a general surgeon's specialty is the skin and its contents. <laughs> and I think uh, primary care is, is like that as well. You have to be, you have to have the courage and the, the sense of uh, ability, the, the sense of uh, commitment to be what your patients need you to be. Uh, family medicine, though, needs backup for general internal medicine. I'm a general internist. I've done primary care. I've, you know, people called me a specialist for a while when I had a large HIV practice. I'm not ID boarded, but turns out if you do something all the time, you, you go deeper than some of the ID docs do <laughs> into, into those things. Um, general internal medicine, I think, it brings value to rural in that all those, you know, rural Americans tend to be poor, less educated, overweight, chronically ill. That is, I mean, that's our sweet spot for general internal medicine. The more complex and the more inner, the more things to consider, we, we tend to, uh, they call us fleas because we're the last ones to leave the body, but the, the, other, is, the other side of that is that we actually are committed to, to taking people through uh, their, their, um, their life journey. Uh, pediatrics, you know, pediatrics and actually OB. There are so many obstetrical deserts and, and getting pediatric care. You can't bring uh, rip kids out of their family and, and bring them to the urban referral centers and expect anything good to happen. Uh, the specialty care issues, I, I think the, the crying societal need is psychiatry. <clears throat> 
um, depression, loneliness, isolation, um, substance use disorder. It's just a, a, a miasma of problems that uh, we psychiatrists need and behavioral health absolutely needs to be part of the mix. General surgery. General surgery in a in a um, urban referral center is one thing. Most general surgeons go on to do a fellowship nowadays. The idea of a general surgeon, the typical, you know, the, the historically uh, common general surgeon, there was a there was a guy that operated on my entire family except me. In he's from Wolf Point, Montana. He tra had excellent training, but he was essentially an itinerant surgeon. He'd do. Um, Bill Roth ones and twos, and he'd do uh, crash C-sections, and he would work with the local family docs to, to keep people at their homes. I'm not sure, I don't think we need itinerant surgeons anymore, but we need people out there who, uh, who have the courage and the agency to, to really be generalists. And, and there's something we're learning, in a lot, we're, we're losing in a lot of the uh, training centers. Uh, family docs are a great start for uh, OB services, but they're not, they, they need backup. If you're going to have midwives, family docs, and um, pediatricians, you really need to have OBGYN somewhere in the mix uh, available. So what are the different co uh, core models? What are the get a different graduate, graduate medical education models? Um, a core program is, is independently accredited, meaning it's not subordinate to some other program. Minimum size is uh, four residents per year for family medicine. And actually, the, by special arrangements, uh, by the, you, you can get allowances from AC, ACGME to run smaller programs. I know I was involved in helping one program that got accredited for 333. You have to have an educational reason to do that, but it's possible. Medicine, uh, five, five residents a year for three years. That's 15 residents. Uh, that's a huge lift to put a, together a call schedule with only 15 residents. Um, I think uh, 12s is a sweet spot. If you can get to 10 or 12 a year, then you can actually put together a call schedule. Because really, for internal medicine, you need an ICU call schedule, an inpatient call schedule, and an ambulatory call schedule. And, um, that makes it easier, uh, doable. General surgery, it's three residents a year for five years. I don't know, I'm personally not aware of any 333 general surgery, or three, Bill, do you, are you aware of that? I can't imagine that. Uh, it's, it's, it is hard to imagine doing that. Psych, um, psyche, you, you can do it. The issue there is to have the spread. Uh, there are so very few, child psychiatrists around, and having the inpatient, the outpatient, the child psychiatry, um, uh, a lot of these are done as rural training tracks, which are, which are, are not independently um, accredited. Now, the key here, and the reason it's in bold, is that you need a community and a local healthcare institution of sufficient size to have the patients. I mean, you can't t teach residents pediatrics if they're not if they don't have the pediatric uh, patients there. So you really have to have a carrying capacity of either having the care flow, the, the care delivered in the community or being able to build towards providing that because the practice is the curriculum. I mean, as a general internist, I, learned, I became a so-called HIV specialist because I saw a lot of people with HIV, you know, like, I never saw he, uh, anybody with severe hemophilia as a student or a resident, but all of a sudden I had 70 severe hemophiliacs in my practice and another 200 uh, gay men. So I just had to learn what I needed to take care of them. And I think that's, that's what we do. We, we rise to what um, patients need from us. So core models, uh, core programs are independently accredited and then they have minimum size. There are also rural training tracks. R a rural training track is one where at least 50% of the training occurs in a, a federally designated rural setting. If you want to find out if an address is rural or not, find the specific address. Go to uh, Google, am I rural? 
put that address in and it will tell you whether the federal government considers it rural. Um, for rural training tracks, it needs to be absolutely federally accredited. Now, in internal medicine, my field, what I've looked for is settings that are rural facing, someplace which has, serves a rural community but has the specialty infra infrastructure and the services available so residents can go deep into, you know, having somebody on six weeks of IV antibiotics for a chronic infection and having the rheumatologists that are taking care of the vasculitis, but then being able to go and having a clinic and a, a, a rural experience as well. It probably isn't as necessary for family medicine. Um, <clears throat> a rural internist needs to know a lot of critical care medicine. Most family docs kind of have a familiarization tour through an ICU, but it's not really a, it doesn't have to be a, a, a full immersion and um, um, a strong clinical responsibility. Um, <clears throat> most of the rural training tracks are in family medicine. I know of at least one in internal medicine. They tend to take about one or three residents a year. The program I ran in, uh, in Montana, we had rural rotations so we found <clears throat> uh, faculty who were willing to, what we'd call them as preceptors, I guess the, the moniker here is a docent, in, in the small towns who would take residence for one or two months a year. So every resident got an experience either in Livingston, Montana, or Sheridan, Wyoming. Happily, both Livingston and Sheridan have graduates of that program who've settled in those areas. Um, looks like permanently. So that's, to me, that's a, that, that's a small success. But that's the rural rotation part. There are all kinds of funding nuances here which are changing with current legislation. So having a, <clears throat> a finance person who is not just a dilettante in graduate medical education funding, but is part of a community, a learning community around that is really important because uh, the ground is, is shifting under our feet. So what does it take to grow a GME program? I grew up in an area where you couldn't buy vegetables, so we grew them. Everybody had a garden because if you wanted fresh vegetables, that's what you did. We also raised chickens and all that, that things too. Probably a common Kansas uh, story as well, or uh, in Missouri story as well. Um, the program mission is really important. It sounds like all kind of management consultant stuff, but you have to know what you're trying to do. People need to be, people ought to be able to stand on one foot and say, what is this program here, here for? It shouldn't be a long, a long kind of flowery statement. For the Billings program, it was to bring general internists to the region. Real simple. Um, but spending the time up front, a lot of the management folks and, and, and um, people that get assigned the task of starting graduate medical education tend to go to the, to the spreadsheets really early saying, Show, show me the money, let's, let's get the money to do this. But that's, I, I would flip that on its head and say, what are you trying to do? What is, the, what is the best clinical care model for this community that we wanna serve? Let's find out the skills and competencies and team roles that are required to, to serve that community and then build the curriculum around bringing people up to speed on, on, on those role models. Don't start with the money, build the money back from, from what, you, what your desired future state is. Um, community support, you know, honestly, in rural America, um, the, the business people, the politicians, the, you know, if there, if there is a public health infrastructure, you can go to, go to people like that and ask them what they need and they will be your, your oftentimes your best supporters, sometimes dragging the medical staff along with it. Um, so the community support is key. Training resources, again, you need, look at your, uh, your curriculum expectations and your accreditation requirements and you have to have, you know, you have to have a, an authentic experience in an ICU and you have to be able to learn procedures and 
or nowadays you're really not required in medicine, but you really should le learn point of care ultrasound because you don't have IR and, and, and radiology available 24 seven in these places. We tend to think we're recruiting medical students to residency when in practical, in, in a pragmatic sense, we're recruiting their families and their spouses and their significant others. You know, it's, it's really a, a family <laughs> recruitment thing. People don't want, you know, you're not recruiting an individual, you're recruiting their, their cohort to there, including their, their colleagues. Um, and you have to have money to start it, but you also have to, have to have the money to, uh, to retain it. So what's the return on investment? Um, for the hospital administrator, it's new providers for the community. Uh, you can't, it's very difficult to recruit a business to a community, a community unless there is quality healthcare available. Um, the modern economy is changing rapidly and people do want to live in rural areas where it's affordable and there's a little, little more, uh, uh, you're less constrained by your environment. But you have to have basic things available. Um, community access, you know, we were talking last night about helicoptering people to urban medical centers when they get sick. Oftentimes, the medical transport is more expensive than the care that would, that would have been delivered if it was available in town. We, we got to stop using our hospital ICU beds and uh, helicopters as our investment in healthcare and actually get care to the communities where those people are. Um, it takes, you know, people have to have an owner mentality, not a renter or a tourist mentality. Uh, healthcare staff who are, know they're gonna be living in an area and working in an area for a long time, it's worth it for them to invest in systems and uh, structure and process because they're, it's like eating your own cooking. You take, you take a different perspective when you're, you're living in that. So um, the other thing is that most primary care physicians, especially rural physicians in this country are, you know, older than 50. Many of us are older than 60 and some of us hang on, you know, I guess I, I, I admire people who have practiced in their 80s. Um, I recognize my own stamina and my own ability to care. I, I, I think I, I've accumulated some wisdom over the years, but I've lost a lot of resilience and, uh, and malleability and flexibility. So recruiting and retaining local physicians is, is key. So the benefit of local care is that People have context awareness. If you live in a community, you know what the local institutions are. You know if hospice, palliative care, mental health, um, substance, you know, medical assisted therapy for opioid, you know, you know what's available and even more importantly, you know what's not available and what you need, absolutely need to send people out for. Um, people need to be committed to and skilled in excellent patient care. You know, when I went out into practice in 1983, uh, there was no internet available to me. I had a Harrison's and a ortho book, and I had a red book for pediatrics because uh, if I was a doctor on call, it didn't make any difference if I was an internist. If a kid came into the ED, I was the guy, so you needed to be really res resilient. A rural physician need not practice in isolated desperation anymore. I think as educators and providers, it's up to us to build a, a community of practice as if we were next door to that primary care doc. So they can call up the oncologist and say, hey, this person just finished chemotherapy. They got a fever and I can't find anything on exam. And if the, if the ID or the oncology doc knows and trusts that doctor, I mean, there's, there's, there's not all that much to offer neutropenic fever in the first uh, few hours, and the first few hours are the most important thing. Having that commitment and being able to stay up to date is, is absolutely key. The other thing is, in a small town, the doc is 
is the leader. They're oftentimes the public health person. They're the p people that the politicians call to say, should we get vaccinated or not? They're, they're, uh, they're, they have the system duties, but also the, the reputation and the relationships and the trust to take care of vulnerable people. So the way ACGME is structured, you have sponsoring institutions which can host many programs. Like uh, I'm guessing University Health is the sponsoring institution or is it the medical school? Usually it's going to be a hospital, uh, the, the folks that take the money. Sometimes, sometimes not always. But there's a sponsoring institution that gets accredited from the institutional committee at the ACGME. And under that is the, uh, the, um, the individual residency programs. The most common thing is hospitals. I think that is a systemic, that is a structural defect in our healthcare system. 50 years ago, hospital-based training kind of made sense for internal medicine. But with chronic illness, illness we deal with today, we need, you know, so I was on the joint committee. I'm not a business person, but I was on the joint commission for nine years sitting around with these chief executives from big hospital corporations, most of which, if you looked up their tax information, most of these execs were making between three and $15 million a year. And their business model is taking people from, let's say, Albany, Missouri to St. Louis or somewhere and filling hospital beds with people from afar. That is a crazy model for societal benefit. I think hospitals um, have used, the, the, day, the positive thing is hospitals is where the care is and that's where you see the sick patients. So you gotta go where, where you can get the experience. The, the downside of that though is that hospitals have a tendency to use Residents as a, a docile workforce of infinite capacity, rather than a contribution to the so, uh, of social justice and, and service to the community, and it takes enlightened and committed and informed organizational leadership to break out of that cultural entrapment of hospital business models. It's clear to me the UMKC was conceived and founded on a community-based system. This is not grist for the mill for St. Luke's or Truman or whatever. It's because the community needs doctors. Uh, those of you who, who train afar after you finish medical school, you'll see, many of you will see very different models from that. So community health centers, federal quali qualified health centers, sponsor some programs. They tend to be family medicine programs because they don't have the depth of care to, um, to really take care of sick people through the entirety of illness, unless they're in very close and mutually beneficial partnerships with hospitals. They're, they tend to be a little shallow for services, in my opinion. Um, most funding for Residency comes from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, what used to be called HICFA or the Healthcare Financing. Uh, it's the federal government paying for healthcare. And uh, I won't go into the arcane, it's sort of the ontogeny and phylogeny of that, but basically they pay for through Medicare for training and that, that money goes to hospitals and it usually stops in hospitals, uh, hospital finance departments without actually getting to GME. Teaching health centers are funded through the Health Resources and Service uh, Administration, HRSA. Uh, health Research and Services Administration, I think. HRSA funds teaching health centers around the high concept of let's train physicians in the community away from hospitals so that we can break out of that and get you know, exit velocity from the, from the orbit of, of hospitals. It's tough because that's soft money. CMS, basically, if you obey the rules and keep your program full, all you gotta do is stay accredited, stay staffed, and you get the money from the federal government. Teaching health centers has to be approved, I think, every two or three years, so it's pretty tough administratively to, to take that bet. Um, there are other sponsors, but 
probably not relevant to this community so much. Um, I think there's only one, I, I only know of one VA sponsored internal medicine program in the country. There used to be a lot of VA programs and there's not so much anymore. Rural tracks and rotations uh, have to be affiliated with the core program. So UMKC could run a rural uh, family medicine, internal medicine program somewhere else, but under the core program director here under Dave. This is a real key slide. You can't take a Machiavellian approach here. You can't have a foreign um, monarch come into a community and expect it to go well. You need to have an on-site champion who's respected in the community, at least in the community. Sometimes it can be administrator, but better it's a, it's a trusted and beloved local physician who, who invests themselves in the program and is able to use those relationships to build the program up. Because you're gonna be asking people to do things that's probably gonna cost them money. It's likely to keep them from, from getting home for dinner a lot of the time. And uh, you have to have somebody who they trust to, to bring them along. And then program faculty. You, you can't build it around one person. You have to, you're building a, um, an extended family of mentors and and supporters and people that can talk together and, and share the responsibility for doing this. So it, it's a team. Clinical medicine is a, is a team effort and edu clinical education is a team thing as well because we need, actually need to show learners how to work in teams as well as telling them how to work in teams. So local hospitals and healthcare systems need to, I mean, it, it's, it's a new gig for them to get into a training mi mission. If they're on the edge of, if they're on the razor's edge of not making payroll, it's a bad time to start a program. Um, if, they, if they're doing incredibly well financially and they're running as a, ver as a robust business and they see this as um, an inexpensive way to recruit doctors as, um, as uh, a fungible and as a commodity workforce, that doesn't work very well either. You need to have enough resources to make it work, but feel enough threat in the community to feel the sense of like, this is absolutely mission critical that we do it. I'm a generalist. I, I can do a lot of things, I believe. Uh, but there's a lot of things I can't do. And I, um, a, a major determinant of the quality of care is the people I send my patients to, whether it's surgeons or specialists. I, I, need, I'm, I'm, I see myself as responsible for their care before they get to me, but also after uh, I send them out. And having key specialties, you know, internal medicine has you know, to run an internal medicine program, you essentially need 12 or 13 different specialties to support you. In family medicine, you need the key five of medicine, surgery, OB, psych, and peds. And in a community, if you don't have those people on your side, or worse yet, if you have them against you, it's, uh, you, you got to we have to solve those problems or at least have a very good plan to solve those problems before we go into an action phase. Um, and I mentioned the, the support from local boards and, and leaders. So it is a training con continuum. I personally, as a physician, don't see a bright line between um, preparation to go to medical school, undergraduate medical education, graduate medical ed education, and, um, and continuing medical education. You know, you finish residency, I mean, you, you finish med medical school, you got a degree, but you're not really a doctor. You don't have the clinical experience to, to actually take care of people independently. Residency is where you require that, that uh, experience and, and judgment to relatively independently, interdependently, take care of, of patients. Um, when the American Board of Internal Medicine certifies Dr. Wooldridge, 
out of residency, we say he's ready to go. When he maintains his certificate, what we're saying as a, as a profession of medicine is that he's keeping up, that he's not using the same information uh, to take care of his patients today that he did 20 years ago. I, got, I was boarded in internal medicine in 1983. HIV had not yet really been described. You know, prions were a Nobel Prize, but nobody, you know, it was, it was a completely different era. Doctors that look, that are a little bit anxious about their own knowledge and look up things all the time, keep up. And as educators and as system uh, managers, it's our job to make sure that it's easy, that, that there's no unnecessary work to keep up. Now, in terms of, run, uh, of teaching, uh, students are, you don't, it's e easier to accommodate a student in a practice uh, in a small town because they can't really make, you don't really make any clinical judgments yourself that go in, that go into the patient care, or at least you're not expected to in most cases. Um, there's not a whole lot of ways to share clinical duties with a student. There are some, but they're, they're not very substantial. And um, it, it tends to be more of a role modeling and a shadowing experience than an independent judgment. Whereas graduate medical education, there are gradually increasing abilities um, with the ability to have some distant supervision or oversight rather than direct supervision. I mean, the, kind of the three levels of supervision are direct supervision where I'm in the room watching you care for a patient, and I can repeat the physical findings or ask questions on my own. Um, indirect supervision would be I'm out in the hallway or ac across, uh, you know, in, in my office, and you can come in, and I, I can look at the chart, and I can, are you on, you're on probably Epic here? Epic and Cerner. And Cerner, okay. So you can Cerner stock or Ep Epic stock. Like, you know, if I, somebody's going in to see somebody with an acute coronary syndrome and I don't see certain labs and meds on in the first 10 minutes, I'm in the room. But I'm kind of stocking them indirectly outside. And that's kind of what we have to, we owe it to our patients to provide the best available. And then uh, oversight is there's a senior cardiology fellow seeing a patient with acute coronary syndrome and I'm at home and uh, they're calling me for the cath, to, to meet him in the cath lab. That's, that's really more oversight. So uh, you have to have adequate patient volumes. You have to have staff support. Actually, I learn more from nurses and MAs and you know social workers and uh, i learned so much more from the non physician uh, staff or in the near peers than i did from the senior physician so you have to have the, the diversity of professions and patients available um, i have done a lot of battle with it departments around electronic health records because molding uh, accommodating let's say assigning a a medicine or family medicine resident to be primary care, to be designated as a primary care provider, as the primary care provider in electronic health record, it's almost like a, like getting the UN to, to agree on something. I mean, it is, it's just scary, but it absolutely must be done. Simulation labs. I mean, some of the things we do are too dangerous to practice on live patients, you know. So pig's feet are a great way to, you know, surgeons have been doing that forever, pig's feet and oranges and things like that. And there, there actually are a lot of high-fidelity simulators. And, and if you're going to do a good job, which is the only kind of job you should do, you have to have those simulators available so that you, uh, you don't, patients don't suffer from that. Um, and then there's the physical space of, of what we do. So, um, family medicine requires a discrete family medical center. Uh, internal medicine can run, a, can, like at Virginia Mason, before I left there, we embedded the residents in practices. So they were part of a, a physician's practice with, their fac with that physician's office staff, and their, they shared that panel. 
And that was really good because there was long-term continuous relationships built there. Family medicine needs a discrete family medicine center. And if you don't have it, you have to build it. If you can't repurpose something, you have to build that. So that would be a consideration in, in St. Joseph or whatever, wherever else you want to build something. Um, there's this issue I talked about this morning of institutional transference, where t transference and countertransference is that relationship in usually a therapy relationship where um, patients imbue their provider with certain... Um, certain characters that it, it's therapeutic, but it really, um, the, the loyalty is, is built. Many times there's an institutional transference where if the, a small town hospital has a bad reputation, then it sort of taints the, the reputation of everybody involved in it. On the other hand, if you have a, a strong reputation, then you can kind of ride that the crest of that wave. So you can caught in the trough or ride the crest. You got to kind of know, talk to the local leaders and talk to the local pharmacists and the ED nurses and uh, the people that know what the what the what the uh, terrain is to know what the rep reputational issues are. Um, attractiveness to applicants. It's not like you know you build it and they will come. People are investing them them themselves and their families and their futures in their training. This is, there's pretty good evidence that um, from the OB literature that an obstetrician that change, that trains in a, in a institution will usually take the complications and the, and the outcomes that they, uh, of the environment they trained in, wherever they go, they will carry the same outcomes with them. That's really scary. There's an imprinting, you know, if, you're, if your professor has shown you a bad way to do something, you're probably going to be doing that for the next 40, 40 or 50 years of practice. Conversely, if, uh, if you know, good, good habits get translated as well. So there's, um, the pitch is not whether, they're, whether the, the applicants are are good enough to join the program, although they do need to be qualified. Uh, it really is what do we have to offer them for the upside of their training. And many small towns haven't really gotten to that. Um, one of the training, one of the recruitment strategies of an organization I used to be associated with, it went something like this. Uh, we're general internists in this, in this town. We work so hard, we get no respect. We, um, we're underpaid, we're overworked, won't you please come and help us? <laughs> like, uh, for some reason that didn't work. You, ha you actually have to have a positive, you have to have an affirmative, an affirmative image here. So it's what we have to offer them. Um, new medical schools help. You know, the, the, the idea of St. Joe's, I, actually, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. To me, the eating is placing physicians in small towns. I think graduate medical education is the best investment for placing physicians in small towns. But an associated medical school that has uh, an aligned mission and an integration really helps a lot. Uh, residents love to work with students. And if you can manage that whole curriculum, curriculum or that whole continuum in a rel relatively continuous way, it's a huge uh, benefit. Um, medical student debt, and uh, you know, COVID has has really been tough on rural healthcare. So it's been tough on everybody, but particularly rural healthcare. Um, we need to, you know, one way to get improvements is to follow a catastrophe. I'm told that the, the healthcare system in New Orleans has improved rapidly after Katrina because they lost everything, except for Oshner. Everything else was gone, and they had to come in and build it, and they built it from a community-based standpoint. What we have in rural healthcare right now is sort of a catastrophe. That, uh, many of these critical access hospitals are a couple, they're only a couple weeks away from not making payroll. And then you shut them down with COVID, and they lose a lot of their staff. It, it's really, uh, it's not a, 
um, an improvement model. It's a complete redesign model. Great opportunity. Um, so financial vi viability. Um, it's really hard to do a revenue uh, pro forma on a residency because a lot of the benefits are intangible. If you do a fee for service, expense versus revenue, it takes a while to, to, to make it. I mean, programs can pay their way, particularly anesthesia and some surgery programs. The, the increased billings can do it, but not so much in psych or family medicine or internal medicine. But there are three phases. There's startup. My opinion is that it takes about, for a 6-6 six, six, six medicine program, it probably takes between 3 and $5 million of startup costs to start a program, depending on where you are. Uh, a program twice that size would probably be in that 5 to $8 million. And then there's um, ramping up the program until you get all three years uh, involved, and then there's keeping a program going. The CMS pass-through for most programs that are well-run will pretty much cover like 95% of the maintenance of a mature program, but you got to find the money somewhere, or the resources somewhere for the startup. There are <coughs> um, foundations that have funded that. Um, there are some foundations uh, in the Midwest which have been quite generous in funding a uh, residency program, but you have to have the development people, the grants people that can go out and find the money. I mentioned CMS, I mentioned eight, HRSA, VA is a huge amount of funding, and they, I understand they have another round. They just funded 1,500 new positions, and I'm, I understand they're coming in to fund additional um, positions. Many of our veterans are rural, in, in rural programs, and if you can um, partner with some of the community uh, VA clinics, that, that's an opportunity. Medicaid in some states has been very generous, like the state of Georgia has funded a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, residency program. Sometimes it's aligned, I'm in a, in a state budget. If you have a fr friend in the state legislature or a governor, that's always, a, it's always good to have um, patient care services and so forth. Um, so, I think the thing here is paying for the first years of training. The f when you have only R1s, only PGY1 interns in, in your program, they take a lot of direct supervision, and, and you really need to staff your organization as if there were no, you have to have the same level of physician staff as if there were no residents pre present. And you really should do that through all of training. Um, when you have R3s, you know, internal medicine and family medicine probably take one or two years to make, to start from a fee-for-service st standpoint to start paying their way. Psych, at least two years. General surgery, two-plus years. But, you know, surgery is a five-year program so far. Um, so um, it is, it's complex, it's dynamic, it's ambiguous, and you really got to get the best available advice to, to work out those, the, the pro formas. And actually, you know, like any sort of a plan, a plan, you absolutely need a robust plan, but it's just a conjecture. You have to deal with what you find uh, with your experience. So having a plan allows you to monitor it and see where, if you're on plan, like starting a business, um, if something falls off, then you got to deal with it early rather than let it fester for a long time. The biggest cost is faculty compensation and benefits. You're recruiting against, especially for experienced faculty, you're recruiting uh, from places where doctors probably get paid more. Resident salaries will usually could be covered by the, the pass-through. Um, and then if an organization has a bad quarter, they'll try to, a lot of times, they'll try to cut some of the re educational resources or cut some of the benefits, and you can't do that. You really you need to take care of your pe people and invest in them. I won't go into uh, the expenses in a big way. F finances are not the reason to start a program. Um, they're a critical factor in figuring out whether you can run it. Don't do it for the money but don't do it without the money. 
Um, it's sort of a duality there. GME is training is not cheap. You probably can't do it unless you have an incredibly generous uh, benefactor. Uh, you can't do it without gov government funding. Uh, and uh, I would say, for pr at least for primary care, fee-for-service and volume business plans are really toxic to primary care graduate medical education. Actually, I think it's toxic to primary care to begin with. Um, I'm going to, we have about five minutes to the hour now. I, I could keep talking about this, but I'd, I'd much rather take questions or um, if there's uncertainties or specific things that folks wouldn't want me to address, I'd be happy to take that here. Anybody in the, uh, out in Zoom land as well? Anybody on Zoom can put questions in the chat. I can read those out, or you could, uh, or you could unmute yourself. Um, Roger, in terms of uh, funding, not all organizations or um, sites would be eligible for CMS funds for a new program. Is that right? How do you, how do you know if you're if, if those dollars might be available to you if you don't have that generous benefactor that you were referring to? Yeah. So um, there that. The answer to that question is changing as we speak, and we're, we're actually awaiting a lot of rulings. But there's enacted legislation, and then there's regulatory rulemaking that follows, and the rulemaking on the, the change in funding hasn't happened yet. Historically, a year ago, I would have told you, if a resident has spent one month in a, in a hospital, 10 years ago, and the hospital was paid for that resident's time, then, then the funding is capped. That almost certainly will change in the near, and you can, uh, I, I would seek competent, experienced finance advice. You can call up your Medicare intermediary, who, who, who managed, who's your in, intermediary here? It's different for every affiliate. Really? It's not, the whole state isn't one intermediary? Oh, there, there are some, re you mean on the state level, there are some regional intermediaries. Right. I'm sorry. There are so regional usually there's somebody with your Medicare intermediary who handles the GME issues. You should be able to call them up, but there's like 11 different regions, and you can get, they all, they seem to all look at the world in a different way. But if you can find, get a relationship with your Medicare intermediary and ask them about a specific site, they should be able to tell you. If you can't get a straight out answer out of them, I can direct you to some sites to do it, but it's quite arcane. Sarah, have you dealt with that a lot? Some in looking to build GME uh, programs and funding within, within a yep. regional site. Yep. The nice thing, though, is for new rural tr training tracks and rural programs, you can actually add that. Let's say UMKC wanted to start a rural training track. As long as they spend 50% of their time in a rural designated area, you can get new FTE caps for those. Dr. Bush, thank you for a, a wonderful talk. Could you go back to challenge two? So physicians in a community uh, may or may not be interested in teaching. All of them, though, they went through medical school. They went for res through residency. Uh, they're now in practice, they, they kind of know the drill. So how do we support those physicians who are in a new program who want to teach, but this is a little bit uh, foreign to them in building this into their uh, daily practice? Yeah. We tend to, in the same way we talk about money rather than purpose, we wind up talking about student and resident curriculum rather than faculty development. And the, the, the proximal task is identifying that group of faculty members and investing in them, doing faculty development, giving them role models, giving them um, somebody to call and ask, somebody to, to really mentor them in their role. You know, doctor means teacher, and most people come by it naturally if they're, if they're still emotionally intact. Unfortunately, <coughs> there's a fair number of doctors out there who are not emotionally intact anymore. There's <coughs> moral injury and emotional uh, difficulty. Um, 
uh, the one, the way I'd frame it is <clears throat> don't save a troubled marriage by bringing a child into it. You don't say a, save a troubled practice by bringing learning, learners into it. And that's where you need the local knowledge to say who's well put together and, you know, invested in the community. And you, you have to have the local folks who can do that. And then, then invest that in them. Roger, we have a question from the chat here um, from uh, Dr. Rosemargie, who's the uh, program director for the Family Medicine Residency. And her question is, any words of advice for navigating the complexities for meeting the OB component of family medicine training in the rural setting? Yeah. Um, there's different ways to do that. Ideally, you would have comprehensive family docs with uh, vital um, uh, OB practices, uh, but that's, that, that's hard to do. I've seen it done, like um, Tacoma General Hospital, a multi-care hospital in, in Tacoma, Washington, has a, a one-year OB fellowship for family docs. They actually run the OB service. The, the obstetricians at Tacoma General work for the family docs because the family docs have taken on the administrative duties of managing, helping, working with the midwives and everybody else to do the institutional management. The OBs love it because they get to deliver babies and do operations and they don't have to deal with all the schedule and stuff. But th th there's different, you kind of have to have the local knowledge to know what your assets are and what your limitations are. I think ideally for family medicine, you would have, um, a cadre of physicians who see themselves as obstet obstetrical specialists. Great talk. Thank you. Interesting challenges. <laughs> One of the big things in general surgery is the large number of people finishing general surgery residencies who feel they're not capable of independent practice and go out and will do a six or 12 month mentorship or something like yeah. that. And I think that, that that's sort of the surgical side of a much bigger problem, and that is the, the, the challenges, the breadth of what people need to do. And so you can talk about the finances, you can talk about the, yeah. the uh, faculty development and what you're going to teach people. But I've had a couple of sons go through medical school, and you know the breadth of what they're expected to do, they, they want to pare it down to a manageable thing. And how do, you, how do you work with the idea? And I guess it's not a question so much as, can you talk about the challenges of teaching students to deal with being really incapable of doing everything they would like to do? Because it's not yeah. realistic to be doing everything they would like to do. Yeah. Uh, showing them role models of people who are, uh, you know, I think the French term for it is bricolage. The, the media term would be MacGyvering things <laughs> to be able to. I mean, Dr. Palmer was talking at dinner last night about um, people, uh, you know, scrubbing on, on operations, internists doing operations. Any student that hasn't read Cutting for Stone, please go out and read Cutting for Stone immediately. It's a really good model there. I think presenting role models um, is important. There's different, I know that the American Board of Surgery is exploring different things. It's, it's a huge problem. As I understand it, in surgery, the, 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 um, it seemed like the compact is that when you were a junior surgery resident, you ran the wards and kept the senior residents and the chiefs in the OR where they really got the operative experience. Now with duty hours and COVID and everything, hey, that stopped working a long time ago. Now it, it is absolutely, that is not going to work. Um, a, so you could prolong training, but th that kind of becomes perpetual adolescence, and how, how are you going to fund that? Another way to do it is a uh, transition to practice. Um, if we see excellent practice as a, a group effort, then you wouldn't airdrop a surgeon into a small town like they dropped Mark Listerud into... Wolf Point, Montana, to take care of, you know, 50,000 square miles worth of patients out there, which is about probably 12 people. Um, <laughs> you, you'd bring them into a, a, a group of, 
experienced physicians where they could be continued to be mentored, but that really build, involves building a system of care um, that is different from what we have now. I, I, actually, I think the solution for this is to build a high quality, reliable healthcare system and then embed the new graduates into that so that, you know, what I hear from regulatory environments, like finding a surgeon that knows how to do a, a AAA to bail out uh, an endovascular <laughs> complication and do a AAA, there's not many neurosurgeons that can do a clip a, they just don't get enough experience to, to do it because the IR is doing it all. So I think what we don't get in formal practice now, we should be able to get in the fullness of time of collaborative practice. I think that's where I learned most, most of what I needed to take care of patients anyway. Windy answer, but watch. Uh, there, the American Board of Surgery has just hired a guy to work on that very question. John Mellinger was the, I think he's the immediate past chair of the American Board of Surgery. The, the Board of Surgery <coughs> feels this very strongly. How do you make sure that a surgeon is actually has the operative experience to be able to handle everything? They can't get it in formal training right now. I think the same is true in medicine. Well, that, that was part of my question, is that, that I have a son who's in primary care internal medicine, and he's absolutely freaked out at the breadth of what he's expected to pick up in three years, and, and very frustrated by it. Well, I think it's an illusory goal that you would achieve competence in three years. You should be able to achieve, to achieve a self-awareness of where you're metacompetent, and have a plan to, to fill in the gaps. I mean, to me, uh, the, the last year of residency is to understand your gaps of where, what you need to, what your, your lifelong learning will start with. Um, I, the idea that you're fully competent after three years of medicine or five years of surgery is just a, a logical fallacy in my mind. Last question. Um, thank you for your review of the <laughs> rural rotations and the um, the rural tracks within residency programs. Those are wonderful options if you have rural designated hospitals. I would love to hear your thoughts on separately accredited rural training programs that the ACGME is now starting to put out some information about. Um, how do you see those as viable options um, and how, how would you ideally um, coordinate those with your strong core programs? So to restate your question, your question is about freestanding rural programs or about programs associated with the core program? So this, the newer concept from the ACGME for sponsoring institutions to be allowed to have separately accredited separately rural accredited. training programs so that we could have two I, you could essentially have two IM programs, two family yeah. medicine programs, et cetera. If you, if you weren't able to meet some of those funding qualifications such as a rurally designated hospital yeah. to, for a rural track. Well, there's a built-in friction and barrier for rural programs in, is that by definition, if you've never had graduate medical edu education training in a place before, then you can get new funding. But that almost uniformly says there's nobody in town that's experienced in running graduate medical education. And importing somebody, that experienced person, is like, that is a black swan event. That is really hard to do. So I think the answer to your question is emerging. Um, I would take, uh, tear a page out of implementation and complexity science, saying um, in most cases when you have a wicked problem, there's somebody out there that has found a solution and uh, that are referred to as positive deviants. We have a lot of negative deviants around, though. That's the path you want not taken. But then there's the people that have come to that and, um, and figured it out. And there's a few around. It's very, it's very dependent on the local environment. I think the first, my approach would be to bring people together. Um, there is a rural training track collaborative that meets in Skamania. Are you aware of the? I, I joined the listserv. 
Great. Have you been to one of their meetings? I have I joined in COVID. <laughs> okay. So their first meeting is in April at Skamania Lodge in, uh, in the state of Washington. It's on the Columbia River. It is a, be a beautiful setting. More importantly, the people that are struggling with those questions from all around the country are there working on those same issues. And those are your fellow travelers that you can get together with and find something that's tailored to the environment you have. There's not a tidy answer to what you say. There's a, a gap of new money, no experience. And that's built in to the way we do it. But there's ways around that. I think having a, the mentorship at the, the mothership, UMKC, where you have, you know, a dean and, a, and multiple pro program directors who are on their side. Now, I would caution you, don't make your urban program director the program director for the rural person. I, I, I know, whoever's in charge, whether they're entitled as an associate program director or program director, they need to be boots on the ground in the place that you're, that you're working. It's not so much title, but it's role. You have to have the local relationships. And it doesn't necessarily need to be an experienced person. Like, I've been both in Billings and in Everett, uh, Washington. I got hired because I wasn't a local, but I was had the experience in the area, and I could kind of stand behind the people with the local relationships and whisper in their ear, kind of be a Rasputin sort of person. You know, maybe that's a little dark, but um, to be able to not be so much visible, but to be of counsel to, to the, the local leadership. Much better way to approach it. We're about out of time. We have another group that's going to be in here in about five minutes. But uh, thanks, everybody, for your attendance. And thank you so much, Dr. Bush, for, uh, for joining us here. Definitely my pleasure. My, my slides and references are online. There's also links to websites and... Uh, many, many of the things I addressed are are in that that reference list, which should be coming to a desktop near you soon. In the chat from today, they put the they put the link. But for the uh, if you go to the website UMKC's website for the Good, Goodson lectureship, the slides and everything will be there, and, and a link to today's presentation if you'd like to watch it. Thank you.